Welcome to episode 228 of In Touch with iOS, the show that talks about iPhone, iPad, Apple Watch, Apple TV, and related technologies. I'm your host, Dave Ginsberg, and my guest this week, Andrew Orr, the, uh, one of the great editors on Apple Insider. How are you doing, Andrew? Thanks for being here. Hey, I'm doing good. Glad you were able to make it. And uh, also, Jeff Gamut is here. We always appreciate him being here. How are you doing, Jeff? I'm doing well. And as always, thanks for having me back. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we got some good topics for this week. Uh, lots, plenty of news going on here, the iPad and iPhone and streaming and, and uh, Jeff's iPhone and all kinds of stuff. But uh, let's uh, just go dive right into the news and uh, talk about some of the stuff that's been going on this week. Uh, first thing I found came across this week is the iPad, the 10th generation, the, the, which of course is coming with uh, USB-C in 2.0 port is slowest on all iPads. Last week, when they introduced it, uh, there, there, there was discovered that the actual port that is on the iPad 10th gen is slower than the rest of the iPads. You, you, you they break it down here uh, in the article here. The iPad Pro has up to 40 gigabits through, speed through um, uh, through the USB-C. The iPad Air has 10 gigabits. The Mini has five gigabits. You got the 10th. And ninth gen at 480 megabits. I'm sorry, the, the rest of them are 40 gigabits, 10 gigabits, 5 gigabits, and then now the, the, the tenth and the ninth gen are at 480 megabits. So it's quite a bit slower, I must say. And, and if anybody's planning on using it to transfer photos and such, I don't think this is going to be a really good thing. I mean, the iPad tenth gen. I know, I know, Andrew, you did a you did a, re, uh, a review of it, uh, or you, you wrote up an article about the the, the comparisons. Of the iPads, uh, what do you think about this? This is, this is definitely interesting. Let's see, um, I think it's pretty disappointing because I think that um, the current Lightning port that we all have introduced, you know, ten years ago, is still at USB C or USB point zero speeds, and so even though it's this isn't a pro device, I think I still would have liked Apple to include the, the latest, um, you know, speeds that they are at least currently adding to their, the rest of the iPad pro line. What about you, Jeff? Do you think this is kind of crazy that Apple did this to make it so slow for especially a newer device? I think it's really weird. I, I can't, see how this would be a a cost issue because at this point the cost of usb3 versus usb2 right it it has to be pretty negligible and uh and and setting this or putting this in as a uh, as an artificial um uh differentiator between uh uh devices it seems like a really weird move, especially since they're not talking about it. So how would people know? Yeah, exactly. It just, it just got discovered yeah. by someone testing it, <laughs> basically in essence. So, yeah, it's it's a, it's a, definitely a, a, interesting to see where it's going to go. But I think most common users of the iPad or prob- the 10th gen probably aren't going to really care much. Uh, but those who are going to use it, especially for photo uploads and such, it's going to be slow be slow process to get those up mm-hmm. so yeah it will be um uh, let's see the next story here is uh let's talk about uh ipad uh, there's a psa here sending emails about uh, apple what has been sending emails i got i got my email about uh an apple one bundle uh which is apple music apple tv plus all the pricing increases that have, we talked about the other day so they did officially send out the message to everybody that uh uh, Apple Music's a dollar more expensive for individual users, two dollars more for families, and then Apple TV Plus was up a dollar, two bucks. Um, so, so the bundle that I have, I have the, I have the, um, uh, the annual plan. No, I'm sorry, not uh, for the Apple One plan. I have the premium plan, which is now went from twenty nine ninety five a month to thirty two ninety five a month. So it's a three dollar increase. So it was inevitable. I can't can't imagine that this wasn't the pricing wasn't going to stay the same for long. So uh, what do you think, Jeff? Is uh, This is not surprising at all, but that, I, that's good. Apple's warning everybody that the prices are going up through email. 
yes, at least Apple's being transparent about it. I appreciate why some people are looking at this as uh, as an unacceptable price increase, even at a uh, dollar or two dollars. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's uh, okay. So from what I've seen, it's sounding like a a uh, a big part of this is related to the uh, the licensing that Apple has to pay back to content creators. True. And I mean, if that goes up, it, Apple's not going to just eat that. It doesn't matter how much money they're making. They're not going to eat right. that. That gets passed on. Not, so no business sense. It's, it's just the nature of the business. And all the other services have been doing little increases as well. Here we are. Yep. What do you think, Andrew? Um, I think it was, you know, also inevitable. It also sucks for us consumers. Yeah. I was pretty disappointed to see Apple TV Plus in particular raise their prices because I really thought for the longest time that that four ninety nine price beat out all the other streaming services. Even though, unlike a lot of the the other ones like Netflix, Apple didn't really have the the catalog of all the other non original content. But I, I thought that was still, from my perspective, a good like in, mm-hmm. you know, like we're mm-hmm. the most affordable streaming service, like uh, subscribe to us, you know. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is what it is, I guess. But Apple has does has done a good job of getting a lot more content on Apple TV Plus. I mean, beyond the Ted Lasso, the morning show, and all the other stuff that started with all, but there's just a ton of new stuff that and more to come. So, um, so there's some value there. So I, I can't see it being a terribly hard thing to to, to deal with. But you know, but buyer beware. You got to decide: is it is it is it still worth your while? And I I think all of us here feel it is. So uh, we'll we'll kind of bite the bullet and pay the pay to go. <laughs> so mm-hmm. um, the uh, next story here, uh, iPhone 14 pro lead times um, are growing as the factories uh, in China's COVID out for a 19 outbreak lead times for the iPhone 14 pro have uh, increased. It's a tracker that claims this uh, and, and a change that may be the byproduct of Foxconn's uh, COVID outbreak. Uh, in the eighth week of the Apple product availability tracker, the analysts uh, see that uh, there has been some uh, there has been some changes to the iPhone 14 generation, while others are more static. So there's been a lot of press about this, as far as you know that, that break outbreak at the Foxconn uh, factory. That's a pretty pretty important factory for Apple when it comes to iPhones. So uh, and uh, yeah, this is from your your. Employer app, uh, Apple Insider that uh, got a lot of this data. What do you think, Andrew? What where this is going? Yeah. Um, overall, Apple did very well in certain iPhone models, especially the Pro models, the iPhone 14 Pro, yeah. Pro Max. They have been doing really well um, compared to the just the iPhone 14 and iPhone 14 Plus. Mm-hmm. So. You know, Apple had their earnings report October 27th. Yep. And overall, you know, they've had some challenges like all the other companies, but they've still been doing well. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think, Jeff? Um, I think this is something that we're going to have to get used to. Yeah. And not just from Apple, but from, uh, from uh, tons of different companies. And... The uh, sorry, my office manager just decided to hop up and help. I, I see. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, um, regardless of of where you personally feel we are uh, in the in the current pandemic, the likelihood we're going to see other large scale uh, situations like this seems pretty likely. So we need to be prepared for uh, factories to have to lock down and and temporarily close down or scale back production because they have uh, uh, a reduced workforce or they're not they're not allowed to let people into the factory to work. So, yeah, I, I think this is a thing going forward. Apple's in a good position, though, 
because they have Tim Cook, who's the master of supply chains. Yes, he is. So if any company is going to be able to weather this without uh, uh, too much of a headache, it'll be Apple. Absolutely. Absolutely. So see where it goes. At least it's not a supply chain issue. I mean, I think that's that that that's uh, picked up, I think, has been helpful because I've been, I, mean, I order a lot of stuff from other manufacturers and it seems like lead times have been a lot, a lot better than they had been in the mm-hmm. past six months. So, um, so definitely interesting. Uh, Pluto, Pluto TV. Anybody is familiar with Pluto TV? There's a, they're a free streamer. They're adding over 6,300 classic TV episodes uh, to their site. Um, the, uh, uh, the free streaming service, uh, the, uh, Pluto TV says they will add all those uh, classic TV shows. And there's so many, there's a long laundry list of them here. Notably, you got, uh, and Andy Griffith show, you got the Brady Bunch, you got Frasier, you know, the odd couple. There's so much stuff here. Uh, and the shows are, are now going to start streaming on demand as long, as well as, uh, uh, exact uh, continuing the content feed through uh, their linear feeds through in, in November as we record here. Um, so I didn't realize that. I, I guess I forgot that Pluto TV is owned by Paramount, which is part of Paramount Plus. Um, so uh, oh. of course they're available on um, you know all the all the platforms: Apple TV, Roku, I guess uh, Sling TV. So it, it's actually a, a pretty decent service. I mean, obviously you had to deal with commercials, but but. Who doesn't want to go and have a, a Love Boat channel and a Three of Three's Company channel? So, I mean, <laughs> so. That's pretty compelling right yeah, there. What do you think, Jeff? Um, I, this is great. Yeah. Give people more ways to consume content in legit ways, yeah. and they will do it. Yeah, I get and this. All this old stuff is not probably a too t- terribly uh, uh, having a licensing thing. In fact, Star Trek. The original series and the deep, deep Space Nine is on there too. So uh, they they got those and yeah. they just added. So what? Any thoughts, Andrew? Um, I've heard of Pluto TV. I haven't really looked into it, but this new sounds cool. Um, I grew. I actually grew up watching some of those old shows. Yeah. Like I like the Andy Griffith Show. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, leave it to Beaver, <laughs> all that old fun stuff. So this yeah. sounds really nice. Well, even Hawaii Five O, Have Gun Will Travel, Happy Days. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of good shows you can go mm-hmm. back and remember those days. And the Twilight Zones are always very popular. So, um, mm-hmm. so yeah, definitely going to be something that's great to see. They they're really expanding the content. Always got to promote it. It's, it's free. I mean, gosh, you know, how, how could you how, how could you be free? Um, uh, so um. Next story here, Amazon Music is now uh, joining Apple and boasting a catalog of 100 million songs. This was written by somebody called named Andrew Order. Uh, <laughs> the uh, Amazon Music is now offering 100 million songs to Prime members, the same as Apple Music, but there's a catch. Uh, the company announced uh, this week that uh, Prime members will get access to the new features in Amazon Music um, but it, uh, and new exclusive uh, shows and series. Uh, but I think you're going to be limited to how you can listen to it to, Andrew, what, what did you find out about this? Yeah, so uh, they redesigned the Amazon Music app with all of these new features. They have um, some new podcasts coming out. And the for the music side, 100 million songs does sound impressive, yeah. but the catch is that it sounds like it's only going to be available in when people do shuffle mode. Right. And not, you know, just at will, like Apple Music, playing whatever song, album you want at any time. Right, because then now, if you want to have that, then you have to go to their their unlimited paid service like they've had for a long time. Yeah. I think Apple was doing that, too, with uh, their cheap plan where you, I think you could only use Siri to, to get songs to play. I think that, that $4.99 a month plan, I think yeah. it was, that Apple mm-hmm. Music was at, offering, so... That's good to see. I mean, I'm a prime member and I n- I never had any compelling reason to want to subscribe to the music part of it because I already had Apple Music. So, uh, but any, any thoughts, Jeff? Um, w- when I got the email from Amazon saying, hey, we're doing this thing. Yeah. Um, unless I'm misinterpreting what was in the email, it's not like they're adding new songs. 
It's just that they're taking part of the library that previously required the premium music subscription to get, and they're making all of that music available to everyone that is a prime subscriber. And, uh, and when you go to the premium music, then you have more control over uh, how you listen to the music, like Andrew said. And, uh, and you also get the, excuse me, the high res versions of the, of the songs as well. Right. Um, and uh, Andrew, am I misinterpreting that? No, that sounds right to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, for, for the way that I would use uh, prime music when, when I do, um, I'm okay with a shuffle mode because I'm going to ask for like a particular genre of music to play. And it can do that. So great. Now there'll just be more music that's that's part of that that random shuffle. Yeah. Well, I'll check it out, see how it how, how it works. At least it isn't Pandora and you're not paying for it, and then you have to deal with the you know ads and <laughs> and right. no control as well. So but we'll see. Uh Next story here. Uh, this was also written by you, Andrew. The uh, the YouTube to, YouTube's to stream Paramount Plus, Showtime, but no Apple TV or Netflix. Uh, YouTube has announced a plan to offer subscriptions to over thirty rival streaming services on its platform, but the highest prov- profile one, such as Apple TV, is not going to be there. Uh, the streaming store Prime Channel is very similar to what Apple the Apple TV app does. They aggregate a lot of the. Uh, the, the different services uh, the YouTube is going to be doing it uh, without having to leave YouTube. So I think this is kind of a smart thing. And uh, the partnership was, was uh, very exciting with the YouTube and Paramount plus. So uh, I think this was pretty, uh, pretty exciting to, to see it on YouTube as well. Uh, tell us your thoughts on this, Andrew. Yeah, I, I wasn't really too surprised when, you know, they announced all these different streaming channels under this new product called primetime channels Mm -hmm. that they didn't include Apple TV plus because they're, it seems to me that they're directly competing with each other by being like a kind of a hub for all these other streaming services. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Jeff, what's your thoughts? Um, I think Andrew nailed it. When, When you look at Paramount plus showtime, uh, services like that, we can think of those like channels, even though they they are streaming services. Mm-hmm. When you look at Netflix and Apple TV Plus, you're looking at something that is a direct competitor what, to what YouTube is trying to do here, just like Andrew said. Yeah. So I'm not seeing any surprises here. It's just more of the same competition. Got it. Yep. It keeps the keeps this going and keeps the competition running here. Uh, next story. This is also written by you, Andrew. Some Apple customers report face ID issue with iOS 16. I have actually noticed this myself here. An unknown norm, a number of iPhone users have reported problems with face ID not working immediately after updating to iOS 16. It is unclear how it how how people are affected by the face ID bug, or if it's particular models or not. But there's been uh, yeah Reddit threads that started about first about two months ago. Growing a number of users are mm-hmm. complaining about it and all that fun stuff. Uh, and uh, what do you think, Andrew? This is uh, definitely uh, something that's a little bit of a bug, but doesn't, it doesn't seem widespread. Yeah, it doesn't seem rides, widespread. Um, we recently noticed this, um, these reports on the internet. It kind of sounds like maybe it's some kind of uh, hardware issue because people on that Reddit thread um, there was at least one person who said when they took their iPhone to the Apple store, the Apple technician there said it was some kind of hardware issue. Mm. And so because of that, it doesn't sound like it's kind of a widespread issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Apple likes to keep it quiet. So to make sure. And, and if, if it's a, mm-hmm. a substantial widespread issue, then they will. They're, they're usually pretty good at acknowledging it. Any thoughts, Jeff? Uh, my first thought is Andrew's writing a lot. Go you, Andrew. He is. <laughs> I found some I good, uh, a lot of good articles to to talk about from you this week. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Dave, what you said about uh, uh, about Apple being quiet about problems like this, even if this was a really widespread problem, 
I think it's pretty safe. You could walk into an Apple store and uh, and have them look at your phone. And even though they know it's a widespread problem, have someone say, well, this is a new one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so definitely, definitely interesting. So uh, that is some of the news stories we talked or found I found for this week. Uh, one of the topics, uh, beta this week, iOS and iPad OS 16.2 beta one continues. I haven't noticed anything different from what we talked about last week. Uh, when it comes to beta, I know, uh, uh well, Andrew, you do run, you do run beta on your iOS, uh, on your iPhone. Uh, uh, have you noticed anything, uh, for 16.2? Um, I run the early betas. Once the official release comes out, then I just switch to that. So I'm not sure what's in these new ones. Oh, okay. And uh, you, Jeff, are you running anything on your iPad that, that was notable? Um, the one thing that's standing out to me is that uh, continuity seems to be more reliable. Okay. Um, pri- prior to this beta, I would periodically have issues where even though my Mac knew my iPad was right there, I couldn't get the cursor to, to switch over to the iPad screen. Mm. or use my keyboard with with that iPad. Right. But now it seems to be working very reliably. Well, that's that, that's good to hear. And I'm I I I'm running it on one of my iPads and it seems pretty reliable for the most part. Um Mark Gurman, you know, the the well-known Bloomberg, Bloomberg journalist uh, talked about last week in his Power On newsletter that what what's expected for the remainder of 2022. Um he he is saying that the the iOS 16.2 will launch in mid-December. Uh, the new features will include, of course, the live activities we've talked about for the TV sports games and other activities. Um, the lock screen sleep widget is going to be available, which is uh, one thing. The Freeform app, which they did announce at WWDC that for the iPad that uh, I believe is in beta. I don't know if you've had a, a, any opportunity to try that at all, uh, Jeff. But uh, um, I don't have anyone to try it with. Yeah, yeah. I, I clearly need to make new friends or more friends. Oh, we should, probably should do it. I could do it on my iPad that I have. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, we could do uh, this. We got to make a note to do that. Uh, the um, the external display to support with iOS, uh, iPad OS 16. Um, that was an interesting thing. Uh, this, I haven't tried that, but uh, it's, it's select iPad models, so it may not, may not work. I don't know. Yeah, I forgot how. I won't be able to yeah, test. Yeah, that yeah on you're, you're the old one. Yeah. So. Um, so there's a few notable things in there. Um, but they're also, uh, he also mentioned that uh, iOS 16.3 will probably get, won't, won't get uh, released until like February or March um, of uh, next year, 2023. Um, so uh, there, there are, has really obviously nothing really right now as far as what's going to be in that. Um, but uh, by that time, Ventura, my Mac OS Ventura will probably be at uh, dot three version as well. So, Always interesting in the beta world. See where things go. Um, I know Mac mm-hmm. Mac OS Ventura is in thirteen point one right now. So that, that as far as beta, um, so uh, that being tested. I I did I did uh, uh, broke down. I did install Ventura on my primary Mac you now. So I think um, it's been pretty solid. Because uh, especially I wanted to try out continuity camera, which we're going to talk about here in just a moment. Um, so it def- definitely definitely going to be interesting to see um, where that goes. Um, Next topic here, I want to talk a little bit about iMessage. You know, it is a powerful tool we use all the time. And it's not just text messages. Uh, could it be something that a lot of businesses could be looking at as far as a good communications tool? But Apple needs to expand upon it, uh, the platforms, because the, the, the big the big complaint, obviously, is people who are still on Android or are, are on Android that want to be able to not be a green bubble. Um, Apple is just not interested in uh in, in, in opening that up at all. Um, and, uh, but there are a lot of businesses already using iMessage for business, you know, Apple for one, of course, using, I've seen Sirius XM does it and they, and they have that specific business chat. So when you have a, you know, have a chat a conversation through messages, uh, you're able to do that. I mean, when I work with, uh, uh, when we, when you message, uh, the Goldman Sachs for the Apple card, then it's the same thing. You're, you're using the business chat. So, but it can be, it can definitely be used as a collaboration tool. So I mean, look at chat and messenger and a lot of that stuff. I think Apple's got some room for improvement. What, what do you think, Jeff? As far as messages go, can, can this be expanded beyond what we are experiencing now? Well, I mean, the 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 short answer is yes. Uh, it's just a matter of how much money and time 
does Apple want to throw at uh, at the project? The thing is, though, what can Apple do that will bring something new to this space? Right. Because they need something that that can compete with uh, with Slack, Slack right. uh, in the business space, and and, and of course there, there's other uh, platforms like uh, Microsoft uh, that do the sort of, sort of thing that Slack does. Right. If if Apple's going to take iMessage and turn it into something that's uh, that's a stronger business communication tool, mm-hmm. then they need to take on Slack. Yeah, they do. I mean, and uh, I I don't know what they can bring to the table that's going to make iMessage that much more compelling to people over Slack. Hard to say. What do you think, Andrew? Do you think it's something Apple should expand upon? And what are they waiting for? <laughs> um, I'm not really sure, I guess. Like, I don't really see Apple... Like you, you said, Apple, the, the iMessage, like with Apple Business Chat, they already have some business features enabled. I don't really see them wanting to split the iMessage um, messages app into, you know, for consumers and for right. businesses only. And I can feel like if they did add more business features to messages, it would get kind of bloated and some things would just get lost in the mix. So yeah. I think they should, you know, tread carefully. Yeah. I mean, it, I have an know, idea. Um, what they could do is, uh, is what they did early on. Do you remember when iChat would let you uh, log into multiple services and manage right. everything in iChat? Why can't we have that now in messages? And uh, and then I can log into Slack and Discord and uh, and whatever else, and have it all in that unified message interface. Yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. It would be nice. Yeah, I just I hope they expand on it. I mean, I think it's something that 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 they they need to jump on, and it really it's just it boils down to like you said, they they want to compete with Slack. Do they want to compete with those types of services that offer? A, um, those types of interaction and chat. I mean, I mean, uh, Apple uses Slack. I mean, they're Slack, they're a Slack customer. I mean, I know that for a fact. We're working with the support, and you know, let me look, mm-hmm. I always hear them say, "Well, they're checking our Slack," and so they are. Yeah, they do WWDC events in Slack, right? Right. They they do all their so so it's they they they've embraced it. I mean, now Salesforce owns it, so it's a, it's a little more you know got some more backing to it now. So um, so still going to be interesting to see where it goes. Uh, with that, so a um, couple things I want to talk about. One of one of them was follow up, and and Jeff, you just did it today, actually. So we're, it's fresh in your mind. On episode two, so fresh, so fresh. And, and in episode two twenty three, which I have a link in the show notes, you can go back and listen to, to, to what we talked about uh, before. Jeff was kind of deciding whether or not he should switch away from that dreaded AT and T and go to Mint Mobile. Well, he's made a decision. What did you do, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> I went to Mint Mobile, right. and uh, actually, as we record, I can count the number of hours I've been on Mint Mobile on one hand, <laughs> and, uh, and and so far it's fine. Yeah, yeah. the uh, The process, however, yeah, that's what I'm gonna say, didn't go smoothly, um, and uh, and while I want to blame it all on AT and T. That, I mean, they are the reason why it didn't go smoothly, but I can't fault them yeah. because what happened was when I was following the instructions to uh, to do the uh, the uh, uh, transfer porting of my current phone number to uh, to Mint, right. it asked for a PIN number, and it wasn't clear to me that the PIN number they want is a different PIN that's just a transfer PIN. Mm-hmm. And not the PIN that I use with my AT&T account when I call in for tech support. Right, right. So I put the wrong PIN in. It didn't work. And uh, and ultimately, I'm like, well, crap. Okay. <laughs> so I call AT&T because I can't, on the website, I can't generate this PIN thing. And they tell me, oh, no, no you do star six, or you do star seven, six, seven, eight 
on your phone and you're going to get a message with that pin. Now use that, which I did. And then the process failed. Turns out that if you put uh, an invalid pin in when you're trying to port a number to a new carrier, it immediately flags your your account for uh, a possible fraud. You know, like someone trying to steal your number. Right. So then the process of uh, of getting the uh, transfer complete involves getting a, a message from AT and T, having to type in a code on my phone. And then having the new carrier, in this case Mint, resubmit the request, which then generates uh, uh, a message for me where I have to put in this code, and then they have to resubmit the request. Right. And um, and Mint Mobile support, they were great. T-Mobile support was great, um, which is probably not what people want to hear, but both sides actually were pretty, pretty good. Here's where the problem came in. And, uh, and there, there was a problem with both carriers. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the, uh, on the AT&T side, they, uh, they didn't realize at first what the problem was. And ultimately I had to do some, uh, some online sleuthing to realize that I had a fraud protection hold on my account, uh, which then led me to having to find a, uh, a phone number for AT&T to call. And when I did, the person that I had on the phone from their fraud team was, was very helpful, but didn't really understand what the problem was. Mm-hmm. When he finally got it, then he's like, hold on, comes back and he's like, here's this other number that I just found that you and I should both know. <laughs> and, uh, and you call this number and this is who can, uh, can actually pull the fraud hold off of the account. Uh. So I, I called and they did, and then the, the process went fine. Okay. Here's where the problem came in on the mint side. When I got on to their support, I told them the process. I put in the wrong pin. I got the right pin and uh and this is the problem i'm having now they should have known that because i put the wrong pin in initially that there would be a fraud hold on the account ah they should have known and that. then they could have told me you need to call this at&t number tell them what's happened and then we can uh initiate the transfer request for you yep so it ended up being a, a multi-hour process as I figured it all out. But once I had that fraud hold lifted, um, I just went right back to uh, Mint's support uh, chat and uh, and said, here's my case number. Here's what's going on. I have uh, gotten AT&T to lift the hold. Please do the transfer request now. And uh, And they did. And from the time that they started that to the time that my phone number was active on Mint Mobile was 10 minutes. Yeah. So So if you have the right info to begin with, it's a super fast, super simple process. Sounds like the moral of the story is to prepare yourself for porting of, of a number. You've got to know all the steps. <laughs> right. I mean, if, if someone like me that's deep in this all the time can can misunderstand what pin they need, then the the average person can do it too. Yeah. And can you imagine the frustration they would have trying to sort out what what I did? Absolutely, uh, Andrew. What what uh, carry do you use uh, for your uh, for your phone? Uh, I am with Visible. This is an MVNO from uh, Verizon. Okay, yeah, we talked about that's episode two twenty three. We did go through a lot of the MVNO uh, uh, carriers that were. And I remember we we talked about them. So they they they're giving you good service. Um, I've had problems with them recently. I tried switching to T-Mobile, but I had issues and that didn't work. So hmm. I'm still with them for now. Okay. Yeah, I've been with T-Mobile for a number of years now, and then Mint is MVNO for T-Mobile. So, uh, so uh, I've been pretty happy with them. So yeah, give it another try, another shot. You might even consider Mint. I mean, Mint might be uh, another opportunity because the pricing for Mint is pretty incredible. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I I was paying. Uh, 90 something a month f- for uh, my service on AT&T. Yeah. The same service 
on mint is twenty dollars a month. <laughs> that's that's like wow. <laughs> yeah, and e- even when AT and T tried to uh, to talk me out of leaving, because of course they have to. Yes, they were trying to come up with all these deals, and the best they could get for me. Assuming that I signed up for AARP <laughs> would be 50 something a month. Oh God. Otherwise it, it was like 60 a month. And I'm like, Hey, but okay. You're offering me for one month. What will cost me on mint for a whole quarter. Right. It's, it, I mean, thank you for trying to cut me a, a better <laughs> deal, but you can't cut me that yeah. good of a deal. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you got you got switched, and uh, I mean, I use Mint. I tried Mint Mobile in the past, and they have really good service. I just now we we've got I've got a family plan of a number of lines uh, that uh, on T-Mobile, and we we divide that up, and the the pricing's really good. I'm only paying forty dollars for my phone a month, so uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, when you have a good deal, there you go. Yeah. Um, interesting thing with AT and T, uh, the the person that helped me initially before I ended up having to call back and, yeah. and get into the whole fraud team thing. She, I mean, she was great. And she, and before we wrapped up, she said, because I told her, look, I'm signing up for the three month thing. And that's it. I mean, this, this is happening. Yeah. She, she said, well, just so you know, we have a, uh, a special program where if you want to come back to us within 59 days of leaving, you you let us know, and then we take your account that already exists, and we just reactivate it. Mm. And so there's there's like nothing special you have to do. Mm. And, and then she said, and of course, you know, we can we can figure out what's the best deal for you, and and get some prices down there. Um, so the the fact that I've signed up for three months. And if I, if it turns out that for whatever reason Mint just does not work for me, and I need to go back to AT and T. Sure. They they've done the smart thing, which is make it super easy to come back. Yeah. Just call them and let them know, and they flip a switch. Smart. And uh, yeah, probably have to send me a new SIM, but whatever. Yeah, well, everything with eSIM now too. Things are changing with that as well. So. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and you can have multiple eSIMs attached right. to your SIM, and you can switch between them. Yeah, so they could just do that. Yep. So no, good. Thanks for sharing your your experience. Um, real quick, I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, home internet ISP that I have. I was, I've been with Comcast Xfinity for a long time and, um, I've been itching, waiting for AT&T fiber to come to my neighborhood. Well, uh, they finally came. <laughs> so I decided to just, I to, to want to check it out. Um, so I, I got the one gigabit plan and, um, uh, I, I must say I'm, I'm using it right now as we're doing this show. So, uh, Speeds are pretty incredible. You got uh, one gig up and one gig down, and you're getting full. I eight. thought you were talking faster. I, I did go two gig, and then I, I and I started see, looking at it. I'm like, I, you, you're never. I'm never going to attain that. And plus, I didn't find it to be that much of a. It's it's like a thirty dollar difference in price a month, so it's like I just didn't justify it. So I switched. I switched right away to the one gig plan, but. Uh, it uh, speeds are pretty incredible, I must say. Uh, the fiber is uh, is, a, is a smart way to go because Comcast Xfinity is going to never give you the upload speeds that uh, that they have. Um, so so far so good. I, I won't go into all the boring stuff we were uh, uh, the boring stuff that were uh, that I encountered with the account issues and my account getting canceled and I had to reactivate it. The whole fun thing there that happened, but uh, but. I was able to uh, hook up their, their their gateway router and put it in IP pass uh, pass through mode. So then I'm using my own router, so I don't have to use their horrible uh, Wi-Fi on their on their on their uh, gateway router. And uh, so it's working real well. It, um, I want to switch it to the Eero. Unfortunately, I had to keep Comcast for now because because uh, I mean, family wants to keep uh, TV service. And of course, if you take something out of a bundle, you'll end up paying more <laughs> if, if you're not. So, so yeah, cable logic. It's good. It's, it's a good thing that I'm actually going to have the Comcast as a backup. Uh, Cause the problem is if you want to use the stream services for Comcast stuff, you have to be on their Wi-Fi at home uh, in order to, to be able to see it, see it all. So, cause you can't be on a different network. Um, so we'll see where it goes. I'm ho- hope I can talk the wife into switch into something else. We could, Get away from X70, but we'll see. Um, the uh, next topic, I know this one's a good one for for uh, for Andrew especially, was uh, security issues with iOS 16.1. There was some pretty bad zero-day exploits that uh, Apple had uh, 
uh, had t- taken care of when I when sixteen point one came out. Uh, uh, that uh, I was glad to see that they did that because zero day exports can be pretty bad. But I found this mm-hmm. I found this to be interesting. Um, this was in Ars Technica actually, uh, an article here uh, that. Apple did clarify that their security update policy, the only the latest OSs are fully patched. Um, they did actually share a document from in their support document clarifying its terminology and policies around it about upgrades. Um, but throughout the document, it says uh, Apple uses upgrade to refer ma- for major OS re- releases and that adds big new features and new interface changes and all that stuff. But it kind of concerned me when I read through this and seeing that uh, – that they're not doing uh, patches as frequently on the older OSs because there are still a lot of devices out there running iOS 15, iOS 14, uh, that uh, they they confirmed that the, uh, the, the it was confirmed that uh, security researchers have been aware of for a while, but Apple really hasn't publicly articulated it before. So I don't know if you've seen this uh, article or this information before, Andrew. Would you would uh, you have any thoughts on this? Um, I haven't read that article. Um, it sounds kind of weird, especially because in iOS 16 and Ventura, um, Apple um, added this feature into the system called rapid security responses right. so that they can issue all these security patches and fixes to devices outside of the normal um, system update process. So it sounds kind of weird to me that they would say to even despite that, uh, you know, the, the latest systems or the older systems still aren't fully patched. Yeah. It, it, it kind of, it kind of, I was kind of a little worried about that because uh, they actually have, you know, the Apple platform development link to the, in, uh, it's in this article about, software updates for Apple devices. And they, and you know, if you read through, you know, when you're reading through this, it's like watching, uh, watching paint dry. Sometimes we're reading some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but, um, it, it definitely was something that, uh, I found to be interesting to see that, uh, that Apple is kind of acknowledging it, that, that they aren't spending as much time patching a lot of these older, uh, uh, older OSs. Um, so I, I, I I I mean I understand if it's a, if it's an OS that's you know like you're going back to like uh, Mojave or uh, uh, anything older older than that yeah but I, Apple doesn't want to mess with that anymore same thing in iOS are you going to uh, iOS 12 or iOS 13 you know or iOS 14 for that matter just can't be a lot of devices sitting out on those but iOS 15 is the one that concerns me because there are a lot of uh, devices that still people are holding on to, especially like the 6S and the 6 and the iPhone line and some of the older iPads that they're stuck with either 12 or 13 or 14 or sometimes 15 um, that they should be patching it at least if it's still, if it's still uh, current. Cause you, I do see them release stuff from time to time when there is some, you know, pretty bad exploits, but it's not very frequent. There, okay. Here's the problem that I see. And it's a logistics problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I'm not giving Apple a pass on this because they've right. got enough money to, to address this logistics problem. Okay. When you do the software development cycles, you're, you're working in sprints typically, um, which uh, any of the developers out there that, that are listening right now, they all just oh, sprints because <laughs> that, that's what you do. You work on, on part of the project and then, and then that's done. And then you move on to the next thing and the next thing. So for Apple to be uh, staying on top of continually updating the security fixes that we need for the older operating systems means that you need to take uh, uh, human resources from somewhere and assign them to work on that. So what's the best way to do that? I mean, do you just have a team of developers whose sole job is to maintain old operating systems? Or uh, do you take uh, one of the sprints that you would otherwise be using for updates to the current operating system and work on updates for previous operating systems? Yeah. And my guess is that that um, uh, for Apple, like pretty much any other company, you don't have a team just for the old stuff. So you have to put one of your sprint cycles in as updates for the old stuff. And uh, and because of that, we end up with delays. Uh, in some cases, we don't get 
updates that that would be really useful for security. And uh, and I'm with you. I see that as a problem. It's a security issue. And right. Apple has the resources to to make this not be a problem. Um, and for whatever reason, they are not making that. Uh, uh, well, I totally botched that sentence. They are not addressing that in a way that makes us happy as users. Yeah. Any any uh, last minute, last comments uh, on that, Andrew? With this, uh, I don't think so. I agree with Jeff. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Well. Uh, just just be aware that, that you got to stay secure and it's sometimes going to be hard to when the Apple's not going to patch stuff. So, um, continuity camera that's been out now in the wild. I don't know if, um, uh, either of you have tried, tried it yet. I just tried it, uh, with my iPhone 14 pro, uh, pro max and it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty seamless. I'm, I'm, I must admit, uh, it, it does allow you to, uh, Use your iPhone as a webcam. You can also use it to insert photos and documents into your into on your Mac, and then use it as part of FaceTime. Um, and it it does work with the iPhone's camera system. And then they talked about it you know, earlier this year with WWDC and uh, a couple of the system requirements that you're required as far as uh, using continuity camera is um, uh, your Mac and iPad or iPhone have to be on the same Wi-Fi and Bluetooth need to be turned on. Uh, and your Mac, iPhone, and iPad must be signed into the same iCloud uh, account, so you can't just use your camera for any old uh, any old Mac here. And you need uh, an iPad or an uh, iPhone or iPad has to be running iOS 12 or later, which is interesting. Um, so uh, it does it does uh, this article actually talks about this, and uh, it uh, does it work with uh, being able to scan and insert apps using continuity. With the Finder, Keynote, Mail, Messages, Notes, Numbers, Pages, and Text Edit, which is good. Um, and then uh, using your camera for uh, for FaceTime, you've got uh, iPhone 12 series and later. Center Stage can be used with iPhone 11 and later. And then the Portrait Mode can be used in the 10R and later. Now, notably, the Mac apps that work with F- FaceTime continuity camera is FaceTime, of course, Zoom, and uh, Teams, and WebEx. So they picked the top four platforms there for uh, for uh for doing that so uh, uh andrew have you tried it all with continuity camera with your with your iphone at all uh not yet i will be trying it out soon though it sounds like a pretty cool feature yeah it really is it really is um so i started trying a little bit i mean i use i've talked about this i talked about last week on uh, uh camo from reincubate uh introduced a wi-fi um uh, feature of their of their software so now i'm using camo and my my iphone uh, 10r is now working wirelessly which is awesome um so but only drawback to that is if you don't plug it in uh, if it isn't plugged in your battery's going to drain pretty quick so you're only probably going to get an hour or two anyway uh but you could plug it in and then keep it wireless uh, do it wireless as well so uh jeff have, have you tried uh, tried continuity cam at all yet not in anything official yet yeah. uh but i've played around with it some and um, uh, actually, I have a, a Mac user group coming up next week. Oh, nice! And uh, so I'll I'll uh, use it for that. And this is awful. Here's the <laughs> thing that's kept me from using it uh, regularly so far, and it's that I don't want to take my Logitech camera off of my Plexicam mount. So right. I need to pull out my my Lego bin. And build a new camera holder out of Lego just for testing. And then if I decide I, I really want to use my iPhone as a, as a primary camera all the time, mm-hmm. then I'll figure out something more permanent. But right. uh, yeah, I, I've got a, I'm going to build a, a phone holder out of Lego. Yeah. There's more to come with continuity camera as people use it. I mean, this uh, Ventura has only been out for a few weeks. Got to give people some time to play. I'm just so used to camo. I'm having more tr- trouble getting the 10R to work than I am with the uh, 14 Pro Max. Go figure. It's a newer device. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, definitely definitely will be definitely interesting. So um, next topic I want to talk about real quick here is about the home app in iOS 16. I know, I know Jeff, you're a big home app user. You get a lot of, lot of mm-hmm. things set up for your home, your lighting. Uh, what What is your initial thoughts with the, the, the revamping of the app? I, I actually really like it as far as what they did. I think it's a lot better. Um, my my go to 
for home um, uh, controls after I have everything set up it is, I think it's home plus. Yeah. Because it actually gives you more control. Uh, but I'm finding now that, uh, that iOS 16 is out that I'm using the home app more often than I was before. Yeah. Uh, especially with home pods. I know oh, that's always a tough subject for you because home pods are so bad. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's amazing how great of a, uh, uh, a selling tool for echo the home pod is. Yeah. It's, it, it's frustrating because it's such a good product, but it just performs so poorly. Yeah. So but I, I like the layout. It's much better. It's easier to navigate. Um, Andrew, do you use the home app at all for any of your stuff in your house? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Okay, so you haven't really had much experience with it at all. Uh, mm. So, uh, so yeah, to check it out. We have our article linked here to uh, how how Apple actually approached the redesigning of the uh, of the, the new Home app. Uh, I I think they really did a much better job of uh, uh, doing things. You know, with the, with Matter as a collaboration uh, uh, with Apple and others, uh, th- that's going to add some things with AI and, uh, and other things. So, uh, let's we'll definitely uh, check it out and. Uh, See where it goes here. So, um, before we wrap up, I had two products I wanted to review this week. I actually had uh, two that I purchased this week, and uh, the first one is uh, it's made by a company called TechMate. Um, uh, I have it here on camera here. This is a I uh, Apple Pencil case. Um, it's a charging case. So when you open it up, the pencil is right inside there. As I'm showing on camera. Uh, this is compatible with the the, the Pencil Two, the center, the second generation. Uh, and even it has a place you can put extra tips if you want to in here. And uh, this gives you another option of charging the pencil instead of having to put it on top of the iPad where it's very easy to uh, to lose it. Um, it does a really good job charging it. And you know, it, if it's, it's something you want to keep, carry separately, I think it isn't a bad idea to do. Uh, it does have a USB-C connector, so you just plug that in and charge this. it charges the battery that's built into this case. Um, it's only like 29 bucks, not a bad deal. I think it's something that... Uh, as a, as a secondary way of charging an iPad, uh, Apple Pencil is a uh, is not a bad thing here. So, do um, you use Apple Pencil at all, Andrew? No, but that sounds cool. I don't think I've ever seen a a charging case for an Apple Pencil before. Yeah. You'd think they'd have it for the Apple Pencil first gen, but no, they want you to buy the gosh darn connector and get a cable between Lightning and a USB C. So. <laughs> Uh, so, so it's just for the Apple Pencil, the second generation here. So, um, second product here, and then plus these are good stuff for for gift for gifts too. So that's why I'm another reason I'm bringing this up here. Um, it's a company called Fledging. I've I've done reviews on their products before. I had a, I, I have a, a, a iPad case that's got the nice uh, hub on the on the bottom of the case, a real solid case that plugs it in. But um, they come up they came up with this one. This is the white version, of, the white colored version of this one. This is called the Spruce Charger. Um, and this is a fast charge, 140 watt desktop charger. It, it actually has this Qi charging, so you, uh, and it's all GAN. Uh, that, that you put your iPhone right in here, it charges it just, just by MagSafe, which is nice. 140 watts coming in. There's there's four ports here. You have uh, three USB Cs that have each 100 watts of charging power on them, and then the the USB A has, I believe, like around 20 or 30 watts. Um, and this thing is pretty slick. I'm, I'm actually gonna as I'm traveling uh, tomorrow going to bring this uh, with me and uh, uh, it's uh, definitely uh, something nice to, to charge with. I, I have links to both of these on in the show notes from Amazon. This is uh, on Amazon right now for $69, which you think about not too, ter- not, not too terribly expensive for something that does a lot of charging. And it does, it does use a, a standard power cord um, that you plug in, you know, like just this, the standard power cord, uh, as, as you can see this here on the back here that plugs in and just plug it right into the wall and, uh, it's not a bad device to have on your nightstand too, if you want to have your phone propped up and do that. It does charge the uh, the AirPods, AirPods Pro, uh, the second gen. I just I can, I can leave it on top and charge it there, and it, it does charge it wirelessly, or you can of course plug it in and uh, charge it uh, wired. So, um, so a couple cool products to check out this week. Um, something you guys would be interested in on this? I think this is not a bad little de- little guy. I'm actually interested in both of these. Yeah. So, um, but that case, I mean, that's really compelling. Yeah, it is. One of the problems that I have is uh, uh, when I'm 
when I'm out and about with my iPad Pro and I want my Apple Pencil to be charged, oftentimes it gets knocked off the, mm, the iPad exactly. and I'm fishing in the bottom of my bag trying to find a pencil that didn't get charged. Yep. The, it's a little, sometimes you got to be careful to grab this uh, on the inside because I'm already trying to do it. And, you know, I'm notorious of dropping this gosh darn pencil because it just slips right out mm-hmm. of your hand. I'm sure you are too. Um, but uh, this is a, it's a great little, uh, it's a great little thing. And, and, and it, uh, it does a, 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 another little alternate of a, of a, of a accessory uh, that can, uh, that can do your thing. Yeah. Got links, both links in the show notes for both those products. And, how much does that spruce charger weigh? Um, I don't know if it says does it say it on Amazon. It, it's it's got a little bit of weight to it. I don't. I should look. It's it's it, it does have weight. This actually comes in a space gray color as well as uh, this white that I'm showing on camera here. Um, I think it says it in the Amazon um, description. Uh, I would probably say it's got to be close to a pound because it's got you know it's, it's got to have a pretty heavy duty. Oh, One point eight three pounds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's almost two. It's almost two pounds. As, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so it is heavy. Uh, something in my uh, carry-on bag or whatever. Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it with me to my my trip uh, t- tomorrow and see how it goes because it uh, and I I would be uh, carrying all kinds of stuff anyway. But it is it is kind of heavy. Uh, there's there's no question about it. But yeah, worth give, giving it a, a chance here and check it out. So with that, that's all we got uh, for this week. I hope uh, everybody enjoyed. Uh, well, what we had to talk about and I'm glad both of you were here for this week so let's uh, go ahead and wrap it up for this week that's a wrap for this week please send your comments questions and suggestions to our email address which is feedback at intouchwithios.com you can follow us on twitter at intouchwithios support the show by buying me a coffee at intouchwithios.com slash coffee we would really appreciate it you can also become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com slash in touch with iOS. We have two tiers available to support the show. We would really appreciate it. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe so you're notified when we are live streaming on our YouTube channel, which is usually at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time on uh, Thursdays. We just uh, did Wednesdays uh, this week because I'm going to be traveling. Uh, uh, but uh, go to youtube.com slash in touch with iOS, we can watch the, watch the live stream like we're doing now, and uh, we can uh, also listen to past shows. Visit In Touch with iOS magazine on Flipboard, where many of the topics we are we discussed are flipped into that magazine. The link is in the show notes. You can subscribe to uh, to the show in your favorite podcatcher, including Mimir, Pocket Casts, Overcast, and many others. But better yet, go to our website at intouchwithios.com, where all the links to all the ways to listen to us are there. I'm Dave Ginsberg, and you can find me on Twitter at DaveG65. And Andrew Orr, thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And uh, where people can find you. Hey, uh, you can find my writing at appleinsider.com. And my Twitter username is at Andrew or not. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Great. And uh, Jeff Gamet, always a pleasure to have you here. Um, where can people find you? Uh, it's always great to be here and it's awesome that I'm getting to hang out with both of you right now. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's really cool. Um, let's see, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, Jay Gamut on those. Basically Jay Gamut on all the the uh the services. And um and then most Tuesdays with well, with both of you on Mac Voices Live. And then um uh Thursdays on the big show, Fridays on the Mac show, and then usually Thursdays here with you, but tonight, Wednesday. Yeah. And then the Context Machine with Brian Chaffin. Great. All right. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you for listening. I hope everybody enjoyed the show. We enjoyed doing it, and we'll talk again soon.